Okay, our next speaker is Matt Bunch. Matt is from Powell Gardens. As you all know, it's about 50 miles from here. Oh, of course. I wish it was closer. Yeah, <laughs> For, yeah, everybody does. <laughs> yeah. So Matt is a horticulturist for the Heartland Harvest Garden at Powell Gardens. It's a 12-acre edible landscape opened in June 2009. That's the largest edible landscape in the nation. Matt has been with Powell since 2004. First is a native plant specialist for the Missouri Department of Conservation's Discovery Center. And he has worked as a horticulturist for the city of Lawrence, Kansas, and has been, wor has been working in the horticulture profession since 1994. He's a lifelong gardener and continues to garden with edibles and ornamentals in Kansas City, Missouri. Today's title is going to be Sustainable Landscapes. Thank you, Matt. All right. Um, so yeah, if you, uh, if you can't eat it, don't plant it. I, I subscribe to that philosophy, actually, a little bit. Um, but uh, actually, uh, a philosophy that I tend to subscribe to a little bit more is, uh, is having plants with a purpose. Um, having plants that, that either perform a function for you or for nature or for the ecosystem or the environment. And that's, that's basically uh, uh, what I see as sustainable landscapes. Um, all, of these, uh, all of these plants in the photo, they are all uh, native plants that serve some function. These, uh, while you're not going to find edibility, only, only marginally, you could eat the liatris corms. Um, you could also take the echinacea medicinally, and you could also eat the mountain mint. Um, all of these have some, uh, some purpose for insect or bird life. Um, either, either a species of caterpillars will be eating them, um, or a bee or some other pollinator will be nectaring off of them or you will get uh, the resultant seed in which birds will be feasting off of them. Uh, very much uh, a sustainable and purposeful landscape right here. Um, I actually wish this were my front yard, <laughs> uh, getting, getting back to the grass thing. So um, yeah, even, um, even, even beauty uh, is, is a part of sustainable landscapes. And that's one thing, you, you think you're, uh, you're forsaking beauty um, even, even in some sort of sustainable, purposeful landscape. This is actually a nice rain garden plant, a nice native rain garden plant, a Missouri native at least, not over on this, this side of the state line. And this serves as also a nectary for a lot of the night flying pollinators. So, so a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the hawk moths, the hummingbird moths, uh, things like that. Uh, that, that's Hymenocallus, uh, so spider lily. Yeah. Um, uh, marginally zone hardy here, six to seven, you can grow it. I, I, I live in the Waldo neighborhood, you can grow it around here. Uh, somewhat hard to find, uh, Merv uh, Wallace at Missouri Wildflower Nursery sells these though. So, um, First up is, is water-wise gardening, and, and I think a number of the speakers have kind of touched on this, and, and so what does this mean? Well, uh, does it mean having the green roof, having the rain barrels, having the ganged up rain barrels and 750 gallons? Um, yeah, it, it, it does. I mean, this, this is actually, uh, it, it is going to be very important, collecting your own water, and, and really, why shouldn't you? I mean, it is a free source. Um, and a lot, of the, a lot of the green roof technologies, of course, this, this photo was taken a number of years ago. Um, anymore, you can actually uh, drive into some of the neighborhoods around the city and see some, some nice examples of green roofs. Uh, there at 75th, uh, the, old, uh, the old Kennedy's Bar in Waldo, they have actually done a, uh, a really nice prairie motif green roof. And, uh, and I'm assuming the little blue stem is still standing up there right now, unless they've, they've come and cut it down. But, uh, but uh, that's a really good example. This, these are actually uh, modular sedum trays that you can, um, what the dimension I believe is about a 20 by 20. And uh, you can fill these with a potting medium and sedums. And so stacking them up on your roof so it's not like a full integrated system. 
Uh, there, there's an outfit in St. Louis that has been making these, and I'm assuming he is still making them. Uh, I'd, I'd, if you want to talk with me about it later, I can get you his name. Um, another thing on the, uh, on the water-wise uh, rain gardening front, we're seeing a lot more of this uh, in, in some of the areas of Kansas City, Missouri, and even some of the suburbs, too. This is in, uh, in the Marlboro neighborhood, and, and uh, uh, the EPA spoke on this earlier. Uh, they, have, they have done a lot of the little bowl bouts, a lot of rain gardens, and they're integrating them throughout the neighborhood. And also having the nice little sculptures with the, uh, the reflectors sort of adds a nice artistic flair. Um, for the most part, they're, they're kind of doing kind of a monoculture to two to three different species in there, so it looks rather uniform. It's not going to be, you know, kind of too robust and too, uh, too rowdy as, as some, some rain gardens, especially native plant rain gardens, can, uh, can in fact be. Um, so here is, uh, here's this all done with switchgrass. And so it's just very uniform, um, uh, the use of the porous sidewalk material too. And, and this, is, this is really an important issue in a lot of the older parts of the, of the metro area and even some of the older parts of the suburbs around here too as, uh, as you have uh, kind of failing uh, sewer systems, failing stormwater systems and these rains that, that come through two inches per hour. Um, I thought it was a, a nice comment earlier today too, uh, talking about the, the old ditches that, that basically everybody used to have and, and how city planners wanted to go to a curb and gutter system. Um, and now it's kind of the old is becoming new again. So um, this, this is actually another form of a rain garden, a vegetated bioswale. And this is something that is probably a bit too much for the average person to take care of. This, uh, this was at the Discovery Center. Um, this actually was a not only very purposeful from the point of absorbing all of the, uh, all of the storm water, but this brought in so many bees, butterflies, and birds. Um, uh, the, the fall, and this picture was taken kind of early fall, you can see the golden rods and the asters. It was just a buzz. We were, we were able to bring in so many native pollinators and a lot of the uh, native species of birds. And of course, the resultant caterpillars too. So uh, the, the issue with this is a lot of the water does end up going down the drain. And, um, and this is a common sight in a lot of landscapes, the landscape drain. And where does that end up going to? It just ends up going right down into the street. And, and so as gardeners, it is almost our duty to start capturing this water and turning it into something that's, that's both beautiful and, and very much useful. Um, and, and you can see this, this, you know, the rain just washing right off, going right down the drain. Um, what's this doing for anything except leaving a nice rut in your, uh, in your landscape? And, and ruts in the landscape, of course, are, are something you really don't want. And yeah, it is at the Discovery Center, yes. Uh, this, was, this was actually the installation of, uh, of really one of the uh, yeah, one of the first rain gardens in the city. It kind of uh, kind of helped start the the 10,000 gar rain garden movement, which has kind of floundered since then. But I, I I I still believe in rain gardens as an important solution to this problem. Um, and, you know, with the exception of we're maybe not getting as much rain, but we we still we still need to harvest a lot of this rain that we do get, because when we get it, it does come down in buckets anymore, it seems. And, and this, this photo was actually taken a year later. Um, so, well, a year and two months later. Um, so you can see uh, rain gardens and a lot of any of your wetland type gardens, they're really some of the easiest gardens to get es established. All of these plants are, are typically pretty robust plants. Um, some of them you may not want to use, and, uh, and if, 
if the uh, guy from the EPA, uh, if he has his list, uh, there are probably a couple plants on this list that you would not want to use, river oats being maybe the, uh, the prime one. Um, although it is, it is a very useful plant nonetheless. It, it does provide, uh, provide speci uh, uh, food for one species of native, uh, native butterfly. So uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head which one that is. But uh, so both butterfly food and, uh, and a, a okay rain garden plant. But you see the, the lobelia in there, the blue lobelia with the red lobelia. Um, you see a lot of the sedges um, and um, oh, what else, some of the golden rods. So, yeah. And just, uh, just another example, and, and this, this also goes to eliminating turf, too. And really, I understand the importance of turf, don't get me wrong, I have a little patch of it at home, but, uh, and, and, and that, that's for us to kind of congregate, but, but for the most part, um, really, I, I see utility in, in a lot more plants than turf. And turf is sort of a biological dead zone for, um, for a lot of animal species, a lot of insect species. I mean, it is being bred that way. We, we don't want anything to eat our turf. Um, yet at the same point in time, there are a, num a number of caterpillar species that feed off of any number of the trees and shrubs that are around, um, and, and a number of, uh, of bird species that rely upon those caterpillar species. Uh, so here you just see kind of the progression of the rain garden. This was later that year, actually, um, from the earlier planting. Uh, in the background, you see a wonderful hedge of a, a great native plant. It is the, um, the, the black haw viburnum. And, uh, this one not only fits the edibility usage as a really, uh, really, it, it's called wild raisin. It has kind of a tasty fruit that it gets in the late fall. Um, it flowers beautifully like most of the viburnums, the nice cluster flower in sort of the late spring. And then you get a great burgundy to red color in the fall too when the fruits uh, finally ripen. Uh, this is one that uh, I highly recommend for replacing the burning bush, um, which uh, we will talk about that too. And uh, another thing about sustainable landscapes is uh, uh, eliminating concrete, uh, creating more porous surface. This is actually a, a, a picture from home, uh, the backyard, and this was kind of one of the first projects I undertook after tilling up all of the yard to create bed space. Um, this was basically a, a useless driveway apron. Um, you couldn't fit a car in there. You couldn't really do much with it. And uh, I'm, I'm a plant person, I'm not a driveway person. Um, and and I, I believe some of this concrete was poured during the Pendergast era because some of it is, it was 14 inches thick. And I'm, I'm um, I, I finally actually had to hire the rest of this job out. I couldn't do it myself any longer, but, uh, but a lot of this got turned into stepping stones. Um, the, the folks in, in the uh, permaculture crowd would call this urbanite. And if you know anything about permaculture, um, uh, they, they, you reuse a lot of things like old concrete blocks, et cetera. So they've become stepping stones throughout the yard. The, the rest, unfortunately, got hauled away and, and became, uh, became rubble elsewhere. Um, so regardless, eliminating the concrete and eliminating the concrete and then turning it into something a little bit more beautiful. Um, so, so where that concrete was has now become a rain garden uh, that has been vegetated mostly with native plants, but uh, still, you know, I, I have to have a little fluff here too. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not completely against the, you know, the beautiful. Uh, uh, well, actually, this was taken this past summer, but it actually looked good the, the summer before. It looked this full the summer before. Uh, that first photo was taken. What was that? 2006. Um, so, really, for the past three summers, this has been a, a really, really nice full garden. 
and just kind of, kind of another, uh, another. So as, as you can see, I, I don't really care for too much turf, and I like like things filled in. So an, another thing with uh, with purposeful plants is we do want to look at the xeriscaping option as well, and and that's going to be in the dry portions of your yard. Um, things like a lot of the agasta keys work really well. Um, a lot of the salvias work really well. Uh, really, a lot of the native plants, a lot of the native prairie plants, glade plants, uh, those are going to be your best options. Of course, a lot of native, native grasses, this is the blue gramma, and this actually, combined with buffalo grass, works as a very suitable turf alternative. Now, the problems we actually have with these are we get too much rain. Um, so we have an invasion from some of these other weedy species that, that kind of like that moisture. And, and these are a warm season grass, too. So you have kind of a lot of cool season things that will sometimes invade. But if you like to mix things up a little bit, mixing in violets, mixing in clover, mixing in buffalo grass, mixing in blue grama, you have created a sort of a low palate and a low turf area. And ultimately, very low maintenance um, and really no water added. So another part of sustainable landscaping is avoiding native, or excuse me, is avoiding invasive plants. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so a little bit about invasive plants, and I think we all sort of need to know more about this and, and also just practice it in our own landscapes. We need to know uh, what they are and how they are spread. And, uh, and most of these are spread by seed, which is spread by birds. Um, some of them, yes, they spread stoloniferously, they spread in clumps, but really the big issue is the bird vector. And if it has a fruit, the bird is going to eat it, the bird is going to spread it. Uh, in the background, you're actually looking at English ivy. You know, nobody really thought that that would become an issue. Um, it is now, because the fruits on these, actually, they will form to a full fruit, a mature fruit, as long as we don't get below zero degrees. We've been We've stayed above zero degrees, uh, really, the past two winters, um, or is it the past three now. Um, regardless, here in the metro, we are quite a bit warmer than, than out at PAL. And uh, these have been climbing many of our trees and, uh, and, and flowering and fruiting, and they're being spread. You know, this, this is a horrible weed pest on both the East Coast and the West Coast, and it, you know, it goes up to the ocean on both sides, and now it's starting to colonize here in the middle, too. So, so knowing your foe and knowing not to plant it is, is very important in sustainable landscape. Just because the plant sustains itself does not mean it's a sustainable landscape choice. Um, the, uh, the pear, the, the calorie pear, a.k.a. Bradford pear, uh, ornamental pear, red spire pear, whatever you want to call it, that has been uh, luck luckily felled there, um, is also another important invasive species that we really uh, need to keep a watch on and eliminate it from our yards. Uh, these are taking over fence lines and fallow fields uh, really throughout the metro, and, and it's been within the past few years that they have uh, really noticeably been invading. Um, this is the kind of thing where back east they have horrible problems with this. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the winter creeper, which people still use in their yards. Um, it's, it's, it's just horrible throughout the river bottoms. Um, you know, the same with Japanese honeysuckle. Um, they're, and the same with burning bush. Uh, all of these uh, uh, once thought to be very tough, rugged plants, and they are. Um, are just in incredibly invasive uh, in our wildlands in particular, but they also become weeds in your own personal yard too. Um, but really, it's uh, the conscientious thing to do is to not allow these weeds to spread. Um, so so that's, that's my soapbox uh, on, on sustainable plants and, and avoiding the invasives. 
and in their place, of course, using native plants whenever possible. Um, of course, the, the native sugar maple, which is actually probably going to be a little bit harder to grow uh, given some of our new, uh, our new climate challenges. Um, there, there is the, the one selection uh, uh, that, that John Pear selected, the Cato sugar maple, which is a sugar maple that it's, it's the furthest southwest growing sugar maple. It was found in southwestern Oklahoma. Uh, it actually does fairly well around here. It's really heat and drought tolerant. Um, I, I, I know I, I planted a specimen there at the Discovery Center, and I believe there are some other specimens around town, but uh, there aren't too many around, but it is a, a good, good viable alternative for just the straight native sugar maple, which we may, we may have a hard time growing. Of course, you have things like the red buckeye. Um, while not native to Kansas, um, it's uh, still a regional native. Uh, these, these actually took a hit in the Easter freeze of 2007. They, they leafed out early like everything did, and that week of, uh, in the 20s really knocked them back, uh, some all the way, uh, some most of the way. Uh, still a great plant, considered more of a zone six. But this, uh, this the purpose behind this is uh, it's a, a great nectary for hummingbirds. These flowers open up right about the same time as the ruby-throated hummingbird as it migrates through. Here are the viburnums again, and, and they're just starting to blush with their fall color, uh, getting into the, into the reds and burgundies. And it makes a great hedge, um, or just a great standalone plant. And, and not only will the birds appreciate you uh, for the berries, they'll also appreciate you for the caterpillars. Uh, you'll, you'll appreciate the berries, uh, and you'll appreciate the flowers in the fall color. And it will actually work in a rain garden, too. I mean, these, uh, these are actually quite tolerant of being very dry or very wet. A uh, really, really versatile, versatile shrub. That one turned out a little bit blurrier on the big screen. Um, so this is another good rain garden plant, um, also a good nectary plant. Um, uh, bees absolutely love this, uh, be, be it honeybee, bumblebee, um, uh, orchard mason bee, they all go for indigo bush. And uh, these actually work great at the bottom of a rain garden. Uh, they'll get to be about eight to ten feet tall. Uh, the flowers are a really musky, heavy, uh, sort of a red wine uh, type scent. And they, they also are a, a food source for, uh, uh, what is it, I believe the indigo dusky wing caterpillar. And this, uh, just, a, just a great example of some of the things you can do with the native uh, palette, not only just native grasses, but then the liatris. Um, and of course, this does support so many different pollinating species. And actually, uh, the corms of the liatris are not only edible, but uh, they're, they're preferred by crows, too, if you wish to support uh, crows. <laughs> uh, the, 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 one of their names translated from, uh, I believe, the hadatsa is the root that crows eat. And, and I did fight uh, trying to get this plant established because I had a number of crows pull them out in the process of, so it was. Yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah, they pull them out and, and just peck at them to death. So yeah, uh, kind of back to the native plants and wildlife. I mean, uh, we are all part of the ecosystem and a lot of these plants and animals were here before us, yet we keep sort of displacing them with a lot of our landscape choices. And that ultimately is probably one of the best reasons for native plants. Um, and, and finding native plants that are beautiful and edible is just one more reason to plant them. And so here you have, uh, you know, this is the typical relationship that everybody sort of refers to. And, and this is the, uh, the monarch caterpillar. This happens to be swamp milkweed, which swamp milkweed seems to be one of their favorites. Um, at least it has been in my backyard. And then you actually see the, 
resultant chrysalis up there. And, uh, and this is another reason not only to plant some of the native grasses right next to some of your swamp milkweeds because they never, they never put their chrysalis on the same plant or else they risk being eaten. So they will go off to something else and, and they'll go ahead and set up their chrysalis there. Uh, that actually happens to be right next to another species of milkweed, the uh, verticillata. Um, but another reason for the native grasses too is they do, uh, they do provide uh, host food for a number of different butterfly species too. And then you also get the beauty of a butterfly garden. And so there you have liatris, you have echinacea, you have the, uh, 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 yeah, I, 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 rattlesnake master, thank you. Um, and, and the uh, gray-headed coneflower, which probably not everybody wants in their yard, but uh, this also turns into a bird garden in the fall. This is, this is just loaded with finches and they're uh, constantly pecking seeds out. That is at the Discovery Center. So that was, yeah, that was, I don't know, circa 05 or 06. And, and this, is, this is a plant I was talking with, uh, with Raymond Cloyd uh, a little while ago, and I said, if you're really into insects, you need this plant. Um, and, and this is the, uh, the white bracted mountain mint, Pycnanthemum muticum. Um, it, it's not native to Kansas. Once again, it's one of those Ozarkian natives. We, we have the, uh, the tenufolium. Pycnanthemum tenufolium, which is the slender mountain mint, and it also brings in a fair amount of pollinators. This one just happens to bring in about 30 to 40 more different species. Uh, Pycnanthemum muticum, so it's, uh, it's known as hoary mountain mint, short tooth mountain mint, white bracted mountain mint. Uh, Pycnanthemum muticum is your sure bet because that's the, uh, that's the Latin, so. Uh, so is it actually a mint, so is it an aggressive plant? Um, okay, so mountain mints and mints. Now aggressive, mountain mints and mints are in the same family, the Lamiaceae. Uh, yes, mountain mints are aggressive, but not in the same aspect as a lot of your culinary mintha species. Um, theirs is a slow progression. Uh, sometimes not so slow, but not as insidious. You know where it is. You know where it borders. It's not sneaking around anywhere. Um, and, and, that's, and that's what a lot of the culinary mints do. They sort of sneak in and out, and then all of a sudden you have a spearmint that's, you know, uh, so, yeah. You, you know where it stands, but it is best bordered by another aggressive plant or it's best bordered by sidewalks. Um, if, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm a kind of a proponent of the no front yard, front yard, which is basically uh, go ahead and just plant the whole thing. Yes, it is public space, but public space needs to change. Um, so uh, I, I, was real, I was really happy to go to Portland uh, a year and a half ago and see that, oh, these folks have yards like I do. Uh, so, anyhow, plant this in the hell strip between your sidewalk and the street and let it take over. Um, and it'll provide, you know, it'll provide nectar for some 40-odd species and it'll be beautiful while it's doing it. Oh, very much so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, robust perennial. Um, so, so uh, uh, vertical gardening, another, uh, another sustainable uh, type solution. And uh, this is actually an espaliate ginkgo. Um, yeah, this is at the uh, National Arboretum there in, in DC. But yeah, that's, that's one way to kind of make the most out of a good wall space. And of course, you see this with fruit trees. And, and that's the other hat I wear too. Uh, they're, at, they're at the Harvest Garden. And, and we, we have, we've practiced this on a number of different trees. Uh, apples and pears take to it more readily than peaches and cherries. Uh, peaches and cherries just kind of grow a little bit too quickly for it to work well. 
that apples and pears are great, you get that on, a, on either a dwarfing or a semi-dwarfing rootstock. And, and you can grow these on a trellis or up the side of, of your house or along your fence. And of course, you know, nothing is more sustaining than being able to eat something from your yard. It, it sustains you in nourishment and, it, and it, it's, it's also beautiful at the same point. And so, so a little bit about gardening with edibles. And there at the Harvest Garden, we, uh, we, we do try to practice organic uh, practices. While not certified organic, we are a biological garden. And so when we garden with our annuals, we try to cover crop quite a bit. We don't really want to have bare soil, and we want to incorporate a lot of those cover crops into the soil as a green manure. And we also like to practice things like uh, excluding pests rather than having to spray for pests. Uh, just because you're organic doesn't mean you don't spray, and there are organic insecticides to treat some of these things. But if you can exclude a pest, that is really the first step. And then also you can trap the pests too with the, uh, the squash vine bore trap. Now this is not something you would do in your front yard, and I don't even really encourage this kind of gardening in the front yard. Uh, this, this is definitely more of the backyard type gardening. And, and so this, this brings me now more into edible landscape and those plants that really do kind of the multi-purpose. Um, this is aronia. Uh, some of you know it as chokeberry. Um, this has long been used just as an ornamental and ornamental for the flower's sake, which uh, come about in, in basically late spring. And then you have the berries, and a lot of people kind of think of that as being more of a wildlife benefit. You also have um, a good fall color, and, and this, this is probably about a week or so from fall color, but they will get a burgundy to red. Uh, the berries, once you've had your first freeze-thaw cycle, actually sweeten up quite a bit. And this, they're high in pectin and high in a lot of antioxidants. So this makes a great addition to a lot of kind of mixed berries, jams, and jellies. But in the, in the meantime, you know, it gets to be four to six feet tall. It tolerates a wide array of soil conditions from kind of the standing water for two or three days to some of the drier, more upland, well-drained conditions. And it will make a great hedge. It, uh, you can trim it very easily. There are a couple of varieties out there that have been bred for larger berries, and the, uh, that's uh, Nero and Viking. And, and their berries are about three times the size of these. So if you're really hardcore about the edible portion of this, uh, those, were the, those would be the varieties that I would get. Uh, normally, uh, you can hedge them at about four. They will get up to five or six. Uh, this, uh, some, some people may consider a weed. Some people just kind of see it as a peculiar native oddity. Um, um, but this is actually, this is elderberry, and it's the native species. Uh, very beautiful in flower and really good at the back of the border. Um, of course, the berries are nice and edible, and, and the berries are, are used in a lot of preserves. Um, you can make syrups out of them quite readily, and actually medicinally um, uh, used as a cough syrup. Um, so, so yeah, not only do you get the wonderful cluster flowers, you get the nice berries, and birds will also visit it too. If you're not into uh, eating them, the birds will. And yeah, the birds will spread them, but it, they're not spreading a invasive exotic weed. So at least, uh, I mean, it, it will maybe be a weed nonetheless, uh, but it's not a bad weed. Uh, here we're, we're looking at the, uh, the service berry, and, and this has been used in people's landscapes for quite some time, but really, you know, I, I don't think you could use this enough. This is one of these things that's in the apple family. Uh, it gets small berries that are along the lines of blueberries. Uh, this, these are just a couple days off of ripening, so they'll ripen to more of a, a bluish purple. 
uh, and they have a wonderful taste to them. And you do actually have to beat the birds to them. Um, there, are, there are a number of varieties out there. Uh, this happens to be Autumn Brilliance in, in both of these photos. Uh, so you get the great flower display, you get really neat fall color from kind of a golden to an orange to sometimes red. And you get the, the fruits, they're also known as Juneberry because they typically ripen in June. And very versatile in the landscape, there are so many different species and cultivars of these. You have running service berry, which form a nice low hedge. You have this, which typically is a multi-trunk large shrub. Uh, there's the spring flurry, which is actually a single trunked, uh, very columnar tree, uh, which would honestly be a good solution for some of the, uh, the, the pear, uh, the calorie pear situations that we find ourselves in. And another thing about the, uh, the, the ornamental uh, edibles, uh, uh, landscaping with edibles, is you do want to make that presentable. And this, this is out there at the harvest garden. Of course, having it bordered by a wattle fence is helpful, but also having the artistry of teepees. This, this is kind of your, your French uh, potager garden, your kitchen garden, so to speak. Um, while it probably wouldn't be out your front door, it would probably be out your back or outside the kitchen door. And so, and so making, making it, it very appealing. Of course, here, here you're blending uh, the, the natives, the edibles, ornamentals, and also a great pollinator species, uh, both of these here. This is actually the Slender Mountain Mint, which is related to that other mountain mint. Um, not nearly as aggressive as that other mountain mint, but it does not flower as long. Um, and so the, it won't bring in the, the number of pollinators. And this is uh, uh, the Jacob Klein bee balm, Jacob Klein Monarda, which uh, many of you probably already know. And, and I know some people will kind of curse Monarda because yes, it tends to tends to be aggressive and run, but if you put it next to something that's even more aggressive, uh, they, 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 they tend to fight really nicely. Uh, we, we use these out at PAL gardens for our insectaries. Uh, and insectary gardens are those that bring in a lot of good native pollinators, but also a lot of uh, insect predators too. Uh, from, from your various parasitizing wasps and flies, uh, some of those things that battle a lot of the uh, quote unquote bad bugs in the garden. And uh, this is just more of the edible landscape and this is actually a great edible ground cover. It's the, the native dewberry. And if you come out to Powell Gardens, uh, now during uh, late June, early July, we'll be harvesting these. And they're basically a native blackberry uh, a little bit smaller, but they make a wonderful ground cover. And if you have a slope that you're wondering what to do with, uh, don't put in crown vetch as a lot of people would do. Don't put in the euonymus as a lot of people would do. Don't put in the vinca, even though vinca is not invasive by seed. Um, plant something like this and harvest it and, and and surprise your friends with a wonderful dewberry jam or put dewberries on your ice cream. Um, whatever, it, it's a plant that is definitely worth utilizing. Uh, it, is, it is full sun to part, yeah, you're go really going to need six to seven hours um, to get adequate fruit set. Now this does grow in full shade in the deep woods. You won't get much fruit out of the deal though. Of course, violets, and I mentioned the violets earlier. Violets are a, a food source of, uh, of the frit fritillary butterfly. Um, of course, they are edible too. Uh, you can make a wonderful violet jelly out of them, and it does. It retains that beautiful color, and they make a great ground cover. Um, a lot of people really, they, they try to eliminate their violets. I understand that. Yes, violets get into flower beds. You want to dig them out. But your flower bed is never filled to the brim. You always have a little bit of space. Violets take up some of that space. And violets also are great in just the front yard in general, too. It's part of the kind of the no-mow solution. 
as I talked about a little bit earlier, the violets, the buffalo grass, the blue grama, et cetera. And of course, by the time summer hits, anyhow, the violets are done, and then you have your warm season uh, grasses that will take over. But, uh, I mean, we're, we're about into violet season, and really, you know, they are a, a plant to be celebrated. Um, uh, another, uh, another good, uh, well, this is both edible, uh, xeric, and also just kind of a low, not, you, you'd never want these as a ground cover, uh, but, but a nice low spe species, this is the, uh, the, the fall crocus, uh, the saffron crocus. And so, uh, so what you're looking at are, are the, uh, the orange, reddish orange there, those are the threads of saffron. And uh, this is crocus sativus, so, um, uh, th and this is something you can find, you may have to mail order, but saffron is the most expensive spice. And why not grow the most expensive spice in your yard? Um, sure, you're going to have to bend over and harvest it, but the other alternative is you have to go out and buy it. Um, so you might as well plant a few of these if you do like to cook with saffron. And then thyme, and a lot of people use thymes as, uh, as a front or as a ground cover solution, as a yard solution. You know, we can't do it the same way they do it in the Southwest. The Southwest has those really nice thin soils where you can grow a lot of xeric plants, but you can get away with it marginally in our area for smaller portions of your yard. And the advantage to time is, once again, of course, you have, you have the edibility factor. This is also a great bee plant. And, and no matter what species of thyme it is or selection of thyme it is, you will get so many bees to this plant. So another good, uh, another good nectar source. Of course, if you keep bees, you probably already know about this plant, and this will impart a really nice flavor in your honey, too. And uh, with that, I believe I'm finished. And if anybody has some questions, feel free. I'm not sure where we are time-wise at this, but OK, very good. Yeah. You make allusion to uh, meeting some of your neighbors who also planted uh, wild front yards. Were you part of a Brookside uh, recognition for having a, a yard that was standing out in a bad way? or? Oh, uh, well, I'm not in Brookside. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, Brook. Yeah, we're, we're on the, uh, the other side of the tracks. There were uh, the other side of Gregory. Um, so, uh, now, Waldo, Waldo, we can be a, a little bit freer. Um, I, I, I know that that's an issue neighborhood by neighborhood. Um, uh, I, I, I believe neighborhood associations need to be a little bit more flexible and, uh, and need to understand some of these issues a little bit more. Because uh, when, when you look at some of the plant choices we've made over the years, um, really 90% of the yard space is biologically not functional for an insect and bird population. And, and we need to kind of rethink that because our urban areas and suburban areas are just as important as the rural areas. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, Brookside is on the other side of Gregory and there are a lot of neighborhoods that I know this is not allowed. Um, I, I think that needs to change a little bit. And I think there are really some valid reasons for that change. I know one tree I really like that I saw in Palma got my yard that's like seven sunflowers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's <clears throat> it is, it is. And, uh, you know, when I first saw the, the seven sunflower, I, uh, I thought, gosh, this looks so much like shrub honeysuckle. Um, and if you know shrub honeysuckle, you know it's also a, a, a horrible invasive species. But I actually have one in my yard, um, and, and it's something that it's, it's sterile. It is not going to set fruit. And, and yeah, it's actually, it's actually a great late season nectar source, too. It does bring in so many bees, uh, so many butterflies. I'm trying to think what I saw. 
Um, I, I, I saw an odd butterfly on, on mine this year at home, which I had not seen before and was really happy to see that. And yeah, it, it's, it's very well suited for our environment. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you.